Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you here this morning. Uh, welcome to everybody watching online, everybody at Pacala, everybody at Bishopville. Glad that you have joined us. I have a new microphone. Uh, people have told me that it makes me look like Garth Brooks. And my response to that is, I've got friends in low place. Okay, if you don't know the joke, um, anyway, I got a picture I want to show you. Uh, this picture is entitled Leap of Faith. And I know some of you look at this picture and you say, man, I'd love to do that. And some of you look at this picture and say, not for a million dollars. Now, let me tell you, I actually think this picture is somewhat misnamed because it's called Leap of Faith. But is it really? I mean, I don't think that guy just suddenly said, here, hold my beer. Rather, I, I mean, you just kind of look at him, and it's like, this is not the first time he's done this. He's probably measured the distance in his head, and he's done this real fast. He's measured his own strength, his own ability to cross that distance. He's had some experience at this, and he actually thinks this is a good decision. He can pull this off. And that's one of the most important things to know about faith. That faith is not just a blind leap. Faith is making a good decision to take action. Faith is not just a, a possession that we hold and put it in a safety deposit box. Faith is actually a, 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 a a step toward action, a bias toward action, and we're doing it because we have good information. And I think that's what this guy is doing. So today, we are starting a new message series, which I really want to encourage all of you to be here for all of them. It's called Leaps. Leaps is about people in the Bible who took a leap of faith because it was a good decision and because they took action. It's based on people we hear described in Hebrews 11, we talked about this a little last week, in the Hall of Fame of Faith. And we're going to start with the story of Noah. And even if you're not a follower of Jesus, you have heard the story of Noah, how this guy built an ark, how animals came two by two, there was a flood, at the end there's a rainbow, everybody comes out of the ark. And I think the number one question that people have when they hear about a story like Noah, and maybe particularly Noah, they want to know, did it really happen? Is this real? Did it really happen or is it just a made-up story? You, what you may not know is there are over 250 flood stories in ancient cultures from around the world. You may have heard about the Gilgamesh epic, which would have been the flood story from the Babylonians. There is a story uh, that the Egyptians had about a flood. There is a story uh, that the Greeks have about a flood and somebody who is rescued and saved. You may not know that there's a Chinese story about a flood and about just one family being saved. And, and you may not even be aware that there's a Native American story about a flood, and this one family is saved, and it involves a man named Nova. All right, do I need to connect the dots for you? Noah, Nova. So to me, the most logical explanation for 250 flood stories separated by wild distances and wildly different cultures, wildly different languages, is this simply this. There was a flood. It really happened. It's the most logical explanation. Even if you're still skeptical, there's a lot to learn. So let's look at this situation. That's where we're going to start. Turning your Bibles to the book of Genesis easiest book in the Bible to find, right? First one. And we're going to look at chapter 6. That's where our story picks up. Keep your Bibles open because we're going to move through chapter 6, a little bit in 7, a little bit in 8. We're going to start in verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. 
So here's the situation. God looks at this world that he has made and he saw the great wickedness of people. Now the word wicked means chaos, it means twisted. Can you imagine driving down the road with a bent axle? Some of you have done this. What happens if you keep driving? You eventually tear up everything on your vehicle. And that's what's happening to the world. Everything is torn up. The, The human heart has become wicked all the time in every thought. These people are living as if there is no God. Now, we tend to downplay the seriousness of sin. We trivialize it. But we need to always remember that sin, walking away from God, is a cancer that destroys the soul. Sin, in other words, will eat you alive. Think about lives that are destroyed by sin, parts of your own soul that are dead because you've allowed sin to dominate you. Sin's pretty serious. And God's reaction is not anger. Instead, we're told that God regretted. Some of your your older translations will use the word repent, and to repent means to turn away. God is saying, this is not the way I meant for this to turn out. And his heart is churning like you churn butter or like a washing machine churns. Don't you remember Genesis 1? God made the world to be good. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that it was good. Don't you remember the rest of the story of creation, how God makes the sun and the moon, and God makes the the animals, he makes dry land, he he creates space for creation, he he then finally on the sixth day as his pinnacle act makes human beings, and when God sees the humans he has made, he doesn't just say they're good, he says they are very good. God made you to be very good. And yet, what does God do when a gap starts to open up between what he intends And what is? What happens when when God's design for creation and the direction of his creation begin to grow farther and farther apart? There is a fracture that has grown into a canyon. And if you were God, just imagine for a minute you're God, when would you have started over? Would you have started over when Adam and Eve broke the one rule you gave them? One rule, one rule. Would you have started over then and said, start over? Would you have started over when Cain killed his brother Abel and said, this isn't going well? Would you have started over with Lamech? After Lamech, the first man to ever marry two women, the first man to ever learn the truth of the Oak Ridge Boys song, trying to love two women is like a ball and chain, sometimes the pleasure ain't worth the pain. Lamech, who had a man brush against him and then killed him and bragged about it to his two wives, a man touched me and I killed him. Would you have started over then? What about when the world is filled with sexual debauchery, which is what happens in the first part, of chapter six. If you were God, when would you start over? I want you to realize that God is sad whenever his creation has a cancer that's spreading and sends a cancer. And now we're gonna learn what faith means. Remember, faith is like a diamond. You turn it just a little bit, you're gonna see something different. Faith. It's like a diamond. First thing we're going to see is faith means standing apart. If you have faith and you're going to make a good decision that leads you to action, you are going to stand apart. And so in verse 8, we're introduced to Noah. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. 
some of the older translations, if you have a King James Version, you'll notice verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Favor and grace are the same Hebrew word. It means that as God looked out over all of his creation, he looked and he said, you know, there's one guy, he's on the right track. Maybe I don't have to to start completely over. I'll start again with him. We're told that Noah is righteous, that he does the right thing. Now remember, Noah doesn't have a Bible to tell him what the right thing is. He doesn't have a priest to go to to say, here's the right thing, Noah, this is what you should do. He doesn't have a sacrificial system. It's just him doing life every day, which means every day he has to walk faithfully with God. Every day he has to get up and say, okay, God, what's the right thing to do today? Every day he has to get up and say, okay, God, what does it mean for me to walk with you today, to take my next step with you today? What does it look like? He has to have close communication with God. And we're told that Noah is blameless. That Noah has not fallen into the cultural patterns what is acceptable in his world. So, Noah... When the guys say, hey, Noah, let's go pillage everybody in the next village, Noah says, you know, guys, not tonight. When the guys say, hey, Noah, hey, there's some new women in town. Let's go rape them. Noah says, I'll take a pass. Because you remember, this is a culture that's living without awareness of God. They're living without an awareness of what is right and wrong. So it is survival of the fittest, which can mean survival of the meanest. You know, we often talk to teenagers about peer pressure. They ask to do something, and we say, if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? And they say, well, it depends on how high the bridge, right? But I've been in circles with adults And somebody will bring up somebody's name, and all of a sudden they will begin judging and gossiping about that person, and everybody in the circle joins in. And if you're in the circle, you feel the pressure to jump on. You ever been in that circle? Or maybe you're off on that business trip, and the guys say, hey, hey, let's go to the strip club down the street. (laughs) We don't have the wives with us. Nobody will know. And you don't want to be the weird guy who says, no, guys, I'm going to go upstairs and read my Bible Or or maybe it's something like common knowledge in your organization, everybody cheats on their expense account. It's a way to make a little more money. Nobody checks them. And yet you've got to stand alone and say, no, I'm going to do what's right. I'm not going to lie here. I'm going to tell the truth. See, faith means willing. You're willing to stand out. You're willing to be different. You're willing to be the exception. Faith also means that you'll listen to God. Now remember, up to this point, there's no record of God actually speaking to Noah. I'm sure Noah prayed and said, God, what should I do today? And then he felt some leaning in his heart or some guidance in his soul. But now God, God shows up and he actually speaks to Noah. In verse 13, so God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both of them, both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Some of your translations will say gopher wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your sons' wives and your wife, with you, and you are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female. Something's happening to Noah that has never happened before. He hears God speak. If I were Noah, I would have questions. First of all, God, what's a flood? It had never flooded before. Most biblical scholars agree that it had never rained before. So Noah is being told about a cataclysmic event that he has no picture of. Second question I would have for God is, what's an ark? 
There's no record in Scripture that anybody had built a boat before. So Noah is going to be asked to build something that nobody has ever seen. There's no book in a library he can go to look at. I want you to build a boat. And I think the third question I would have is, God, how long do I have? I mean, I got a year, two years. Scholars, again, are divided about this, but most scholars agree it took Noah between 55 and 75 years to build the ark. Are you willing to do something that God tells you to do for 55 or 75 years? I know some of you cannot conceive of living that long. But I actually believe that God's going to lay before you and before me some task that's going to take a while. You can't just accomplish it overnight. And I think maybe the last thing I would say is, God, you only get two of every kind of animal. God, is that really such a smart idea? I mean, God, you know, if you want me to arrange them alphabetically, lamb, lion, not a good combination. The lions are going to look at the lambs and think, lunch. And God, really? I mean, two skunks isn't one enough? Are you willing to listen to God? I don't just mean, you know, God speak. But I mean, if God comes to you and says, I want you to do something that you've never done before. In fact, I want you to do something that no one has ever done before. Are you willing to listen? What if God tells you to do something and you don't even understand all of how this is going to end? Would you do it? Now, maybe one of the things that bothers you in this story is that everybody dies except Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. I, I do remember teaching this story once to a group of older ladies, and one lady said, I just can't believe God would do something like that, that God would kill all those innocent puppies. Well, what about the people? We don't know how many people were alive at this time. Sometimes you hear stories like this in the Bible, and that's why some of you struggle with faith. How could God do something like that? How could God allow so many people to die? How could God cause that? And I guess I could answer and say, well, God is in charge of creation. He made creation, and he can do what he wants to. And that would be a true statement. But I want you to remember what we've learned about God's emotions. God is filled with regret. His heart is churning. God's sadness precedes his judgment. How does that change your understanding of God's judgment? See, I, I do think there are people who have this idea that God simply sits on his throne and, and every, you know, every once in a while he's grumpy, something hasn't sat well, and he just decides randomly on a whim, I am going to judge these people. That is a false picture of God. It's nowhere in the scripture. I think judgment day is going to be the saddest day for God because he will actually have to see the results of people's poor decisions. And you actually understand this, don't you? Aren't there people you love and you've seen the results of their poor decisions and it breaks your heart that they are living with the consequences and you have been waving your flag the whole time saying, don't, this is not going to end well. And they keep going. Why do you think God's any different? In fact, where does that whole idea come from of having compassion on people? Now, this story is a warning. It is a warning that God does have powerful ways to bring the world back to his plan, back to his intention. And you may say, but why does it have to be so violent? Because there is some violence that is so horrible, only violence can stop it. Now, in our country, we're, we're fairly insulated from violence. I, I would wager none of you woke up 
this morning and feared that someone was outside waiting to kill you. But that's a feeling that a tremendous number of people wake up to every day in this world. I, I, I heard about a, a young woman who had been interning in Israel on the West Bank for the last year, and she came home in September right before the war between Hamas and Israel broke out. And she said that she actually understood that over in that part of the world, violence is such a part of everyday life. Sometimes the violence spills over and only violence is able to hold it back. And I want you to remember the people who died in the flood, these are not nice people. Remember, these are people that the only inclination of their heart is all evil all the time. They are not picket fence people with puppies. There's an old Jewish tradition that says when the flood waters broke up from the earth, in other words, when the water table fractured the ground, that people took their children and tried to stuff them in the holes to stop the water. What kind of culture kills children to protect themselves? Noah listened to God. He did what God told him to do. And his response is one of the most important things that we can learn about faith. Faith means obedience. Obedience is not a popular word in our culture. Most of us can't wait till we leave our parents' house and then we think we're not gonna have to obey the rules anymore and then we get a job. You know, everybody has to obey somebody. Everybody, you don't get a pass. You don't get a pass. You are going to have to obey a boss. You're going to have to obey a teacher. You're, go you're going to have to obey maybe your own inner voice. Isn't addiction really the obedience to a fractured wound in your soul and that voice that it has? No obeys the Lord. It's, it's a simple verse, but it's so profound. Verse 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. So he finishes hearing God speaks, and he goes home, and he says to Mrs. Noah, I just, uh, God just spoke to me. And she is thinking, right. And then he says, I'm supposed to build an ark. And she says, what's an ark? And, and he says, well, it's so many cubits wide and so many cubits high and so many cubits, uh, you know, uh, 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 long. And Mrs. Noah says, what's a cubit? Okay, if you get that joke, you're really old because I stole it from somebody. Okay. Let's go back to our picture of the leap of faith. Is Noah just taking a blind leap of faith? He's had five hundred years of asking God, what should I do? 500 years where he's gone to God and said, show me the way. 500 years of saying, God, I want to walk with you today. And so when he gets to this moment and God actually speaks audibly to him, Noah says, you know, it actually makes sense. This is a good decision. I'm going to do what God told me to do. It may take me 50 to 75 years to build this thing, but I'm going to do it. Now, here's something very important for you to know real important. You might want to write this down. God never puts a faith challenge in front of you you can't do. God never puts a faith challenge in front of you that you can't do. Now, the reason we keep talking about next steps around here is because if you take the next step, the step after that is easier. You've had some practice. You're learning. So, so, so the first thing that Jesus asks us to do is to get baptized. You get wet. How hard is that? We try to make that as easy as possible. We even got warm water. They didn't back then. 
But if you actually take that next step of being baptized, hey, it gets easier to share your story. God wants you to be generous. So if you learn generosity and you start giving, your heart will open up and you'll learn how to love people. If you will learn to do what God wants you to do in prayer, you will have a connection with God. And when that big crisis comes, and it will, you'll have practice listening to God and knowing how to talk to him. That's why these basic spiritual disciplines really matter. Now there's one more thing that Noah's faith teaches us. Faith means counting on God. I believe there's things in your life and my life that we can't do that need to be done. We can't do them. Sometimes it's a sin habit. Sometimes it's an addiction. And, and you've tried, you know, if willpower could have solved it, it would be solved. But as one of my mentors, John Ortberg, said, habit eats willpower for lunch. And you've tried. You've tried. And you just can't do it. Or maybe, maybe it's a relationship and you desperately want that relationship to be repaired and to actually work, but you can't do it. It's not working when you try to work it. Or maybe it is that wound that so cripples you in life and you know it cripples you and you want to get over it, but you just can't seem to get over it because it's not in your ability to do. And the biggest one of all, the biggest one of all is we can't forgive our own sin. We can't. We can deny it's there. We can say, well, it really doesn't bother me. But here's the truth. It does create a sense of shame in us, and that shame and that guilt, it weighs us down, and that is not the good that God wants you to live. And so that's why God sent Jesus to die on the cross and be resurrected so you could have forgiveness, have a relationship, and live a different life. You count on God to do what only he can do. And that's what Noah had to do. Let's think about all the unanswered questions, and one of them gets answered. So, you know, the, the flood starts to come. Noah gets everybody on board the ark. Who's going to shut the door? We are told in chapter 7, verse 16, the animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah, and then the Lord shut him in. Some of your translations will read, the Lord shut the door. I want you to think about this. Think of it very literally. Noah does not have a skill saw. In fact, I don't know exactly what he used to cut all that wood. How tight do you think that door fit? Now, it's made out of gopher wood, right? It's made out of cypress, two uh, different titles that actually mean a wood that when it absorbs water expands. That's what you want to build this boat out of. He covers it with pitch, but I don't care how good a carpenter you are, in Noah's time, there's no rubber gasket. There's nothing that will seal that door and make it watertight. And so when God says, no, I want you to build the ark, put a door in it so everybody can get in, God hasn't told him how it's going to seal. Noah has to count on God doing what only God can do, and only God can seal that door, and that's what he does. The door doesn't leak. The boat stays up, stays afloat. And there's another verse like this. In, in chapter 8, verse 1, God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Here's the funny thing. When you read this story, God has never told Noah how it ends. He just says, build a boat, put the animals inside, you get inside, there's going to be a flood. Don't you know that somewhere along about, oh, day 40, 50, 90, Noah says, uh, God, I'm still here. Is this the rest of my life? Am I going to spend the rest of my life on an ark? I mean, God, you know, it, I mean, everything's starting to smell. The skunks are working overtime. When the Bible says that God remembered Noah and everybody on the ark, it's not like God had forgotten them. It's not like God go, that guy, that guy, uh, Ned, uh, what is his, uh, Noah, Noah, 
No, 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 no. What it means is God is ready to do the second part of his redemptive plan. And so God sends a wind to blow the floodwaters away. Have you seen the pictures of the floods up in the mountains? Uh, I've got a daughter in Greenville, so I've seen some pictures of the Reedy Falls there in downtown Greenville. Some of you have been there, seen it. And how the water's just blowing over. I just want you to imagine, I get a hundred of those big fans. And I plug them in all over, and I put them all on the falls to try to blow the water back. What's going to happen? Nothing. Only God can create a wind that drives the water back. God is doing what only God can do. What's going on in your life where you need to say, God, I don't know how to fix this. I need you to do what only you can do. From time to time, people come up to me and they say, Pastor Clay, please pray for my daughter, my son. They're in a real toxic relationship. And I've tried to talk to them and they won't listen to me. And I've had my other children talk to them. They won't listen to the kids. And I just don't know what to do. And I know they're hoping that I have some magic thing that they can say that will turn their child's life around. And I don't. Here's what I always tell them. Pray. Pray that God will do what only he can do. I know that sometimes I say that to people and they just think, well, that sounds kind of hollow. No. Because you and I know that people don't change till they hit bottom. And so you pray for God to be at the bottom. Sometimes I pray for people to hurry up and fall faster. We want to spare people pain, but in God's timing, pain is what they need to change. And that's why we have to claim our memory verse, that God is going to do what we hope for, what only he can do. God is working in a way we don't see. In fact, I want us to read this together again. Read it with me, will you? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. God is at work in what you hope for and what you know is his will, and God is working in ways that you cannot see. So ask God to do what only he can do. There's a prayer from the 12-step movement. I've shared it with you before, and I just think it fits here. It's a prayer we all need to model and make. It goes like this. God, I can't. You can. I'll let you. God, I can't. I can't fix this. I can't break this addiction. I can't get that relationship back. I I can't even mend the wounds in my heart. But you can. I will let you. Today, what do you need to lift up to God and say, I can't, but you can. I'm going to let you. Lois Spoon had had cancer, and it had ravaged her arm, and she needed lots of physical therapy, and she became really interested in this, and a friend of hers, a physical therapist, invited her to a conference. She really felt like she needed to go. The conference was going to talk about her very injury and treatments and how to best overcome this. She would be with doctors and physical therapist professionals. All her expenses would be paid except her airfare. Now, this is several years ago. Her airfare was going to be $153.47. $153.47, and she didn't have it. And it was one of those fairs where, you know, if you didn't get it by a certain time, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, on a certain day, it was going to go up. And the day came, and Lois didn't have the money. And she went to a luncheon that had been scheduled uh, with some friends and a missionary woman uh, who was going to tell her story. And so uh, they listened to the missionary, and nobody was offering to pick up the missionary's tab or lunch. You know, So Lois takes her last 20 bucks, pays for the missionary lunch, pays for her own lunch. 
Now it's 1.30. And she said she remembered the story about, about Jesus telling Peter to go and catch a fish in the lake and there would be two gold coins and that would be enough to pay the taxes. And she thought, I think maybe I'll go fishing for 30 minutes and see if I catch a fish. She's in her car. She's about to pull out of the parking space and there is a knock on her window. She rolls down the window. There's a woman at the luncheon that she didn't know that well. And the woman said, I've been meaning to give you something, and I just haven't had time. Uh, I, honest, not, it's not that I haven't had time. I just have forgotten. She said, a few weeks ago, God told me to set aside all my spare change. And then he told me I was to give it to you. So I've been setting aside my spare pain, change, and it's in this envelope. And I, I, here, I know you don't want to take it from me, but I want you to have it. God told me to do this. And Lois is kind of stunned and just stammers out, well, thank you. The woman walks off, Lois rolls up her window, she opens up the envelope, it's all different kinds of bills, tens and fives and ones. And there's a lot of uh, change in there, she pours it out, she starts counting out the money. When she finishes counting, it's $153.47. Now, I know the skeptics among you are saying that is a preacher story. Except it's true. It really happened. God did what only God can do. Today, will you say, God, I can't, but you can. I'm going to let you. Pray with me. Father, we may not be in the place right now where we we sense that's our biggest need, but we will be. We need to count on you to do what we cannot do. And for everyone who needs that kind of faith, I pray that today you'd help them. You'd move our hearts. I pray that people would surrender the stuff of their life and put it in your hands. And for any father who today have never invited Jesus to be their savior, I pray they would take that next step toward Jesus. Thank you for being the God who does what we cannot do. It is in Jesus' name we pray.